Hi, thanks. Thank you all for coming out here. This is my first trip to Seattle, and it is so beautiful, although I basically fell over the first time I saw Mount Rainier. Like, I was, I live in Colorado. I'm not prepared for, like, being at sea level and seeing the 14,000 feet peaks. Wow. So that was really cool. And the coffee is good. And the weather makes me want coffee, like, constantly. So... <laughs> So, uh, well, I'm here to talk about my book. Uh, so uh, what is this book? Well, according to Visual Chatbot, it is a sign on the side of a building. So that answers that question. Uh, but it is more than, the, than just a sign on the side of the building. It is also a book about AI. So when I sat down to write this book, I wanted it to be about the kinds of things that AI is good about, good at and the kinds of things that maybe it's not so good at. Because a lot of people these days have to know about AI. This is not just the people who might be using machine learning at work, but it is also like everyday consumers who are already using these algorithms in their phones or using things that call themselves AI and, you know, in various different flavors or that are having decisions made about them by people who are using some flavor of AI. And then, you know, increasingly too, Consumers are, get, are getting the chance to sort of make decisions themselves on using AI or not, like what should the role of facial recognition be in our communities, or should our company use a, uh, some kind of an algorithm for screening resumes, or you know, what are the pitfalls there, uh, how well is it likely to work. Uh, so I wanted there to be like a kind of fun, approachable way for people who aren't necessarily into AI to learn about it. And so today I'm going to be talking about the kinds of things that are in my book, uh, but because I don't want to just like tell you all the things that you're about to read word for word, this is kind of like an Easter egg, alternative, highly visual version of the book with like full color pictures, which the book does not have. The book has lots of cartoons and drawings, but color was not a thing that I was able to use. So uh, we're going to have some uh, fun with uh, some of my favorite visual examples. And we're also going to be answering a very important question, which is what's with all the drafts? So you may or may not be aware that in machine learning, there's kind of a thing about giraffes, like to the point that it's become a bit of a running joke. And so I'm going to go through a few of these uh, different giraffe sightings, uh, starting with this giraffe sighting number one. So this is not in my book, in part mostly because this result just came out. So this is November from the team at OpenAI. And the headline says, you know, they, te they trained a robot hand to solve a Rubik's Cube. But the, uh, import the thing I like about this particular example is that the solving the Rubik's Cube was not the hard part. Like that algorithm has been known for a long time. That's the easy part. The hard part was coming up with a hand that was where, where an AI had learned from scratch how to control this ha hand and how to actually move this cube around. And so they, and then what I really liked was they demonstrated their success using the first known instance of the plush giraffe perturbation. <laughs> I, and this was actually a kind of big kind of big deal because this was a AI that they had not pre-trained with any notion on how best to manipulate one of these cubes. So it had to figure out from scratch how to use its hand, how to use these fingers. And since uh, AIs like this are really slow use learners, then it took it thousands of years worth of worth of dropping this cube over and over again. And uh, so they had to train it in simulation. Uh, and then that posed another set of problems because no simulation is perfect. And what tends to happen when you train things like this that are supposed to do physical 
tasks and you train it in simulation is that it will learn strategies that are very specific to the simulation, but because the simulation is flawed, it will not work in the real world. So their strategy here was to train the robot to manipulate this cube in a whole bunch of different simulations, each like a alternate universe with slightly different physics. So in one of these universes, everything's a little bit sticky, or in another one, things are a little bit stretchy or slimy, or gravity is a little bit different. Friction works a little bit weirdly, weirder, or like the cube is slightly bigger, slightly smaller. And so the same AI had to be able to come up with strategies that would adapt to all of these different situations. And then the cool part was that it worked. So it was able to come up, I mean, it, drop the cube a lot still, but a lot of the times it could actually manipulate this cube and it could also adapt to situations like this that it had not seen uh, during training. Uh, so you will be happy to know then that uh, this book right here has also undergone, undergone state-of-the-art rigorous plush giraffe perturbation testing. <laughs> Yeah, I would challenge you to find any state-of-the-art book on AI that has undergone this kind of testing before. So I'm really leading the field. That alone should be reason why everybody needs this book. But there's even more <laughs> to this book than this. Um, so one of the first things I actually want to talk about is the name of the book. And it is the first thing that I explain in the book, but that's because it really needs like some kind of explanation. Like, you look like a thing and I love you. Where did that come from? Well, this was an experiment I did for my blog, AI Weirdness. And so if you're not familiar with the blog, I do these kinds of strange experiments, many of them involving generating text with neural networks. And this was one of the projects where I tried to train one to generate pickup lines. And to actually get this project to work, I had to, of course, collect a bunch of example pickup lines. And by the time I was done, do, done doing that, I kind of regretted the whole uh, project because if you've ever read through a couple of hundred <laughs> different pickup lines from around the internet, like they are terrible, <laughs> like uniformly terrible. Like there is no good pickup. There is a reason nobody actually uses those. And so I was kind of not looking forward to having then this thing that could generate infinite numbers of them at the click of a button. But when I actually trained this neural net uh, on the pickup lines, I discovered that it had no clue about any of the puns or any of the innuendo, like that went right over its head. It couldn't comprehend any of that. And what came out was either very incomprehensible or strangely directly sweet. So you would get things like, oh, you must be a Tringle because you're the only thing here. Or <laughs> <laughs> you are so beautiful that you make me say a bat on me and baby. <laughs> and then this was my favorite one, uh, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. So that ended up having to be the title of the book. But this kind of like weird and uncomprehending uh, thing, you know, I see that a lot on my blog. So here's another of one of my favorite examples. So this is a project where I trained a neural net to generate paint colors. So if you can see maybe coming what's going to happen here. These are the real ones on the left, these examples of existing paint colors. And then here is what the neural net <laughs> produced. <laughs> so uh, the interesting thing about this is technically this is what I had asked for because what I thought when I thought I was asking it to like generate nice paint color names that went with the colors that it was specifying, what I was actually asking it to do was to imitate the kinds of letter combinations that it saw in the original paint colors. And without any information on like what other words mean or maybe there are some words that you should avoid, uh, it, you know, did its what it interpreted as its goal. Uh, so people who read, read my blog and read examples like this, like they started to ask me, why is this 
so clueless? Like, why is it making these mistakes? Isn't AI supposed to be smart? And so this book is kind of me setting out to answer this question. Um, and actually, one of the first questions that I had to answer is, what even is AI? Uh, because that is you get all these different definitions depending on whether somebody's writing science fiction or doing research or trying to sell a product. And so like in science fiction, for example, the AIs are usually at human level or significantly above. So these are smart enough to understand the world well enough to come up with their own goals, which may not be aligned with the human goals, and then we get problems. Uh, so this would be the AIs like, uh, Skynet, RTD2, Wally, basically just about any AI science fiction character you can think of. And this is why, too, like this kind of really smart human level thinking, feeling AI is the most familiar kind in a lot of ways. Uh, the, and then the AI that we have in real life, though, of course, is way different. So as you know, very roughly speaking, has got the approximate computing power of an earthworm, more or less. And, you know, but with an earthworm level computation, you can do a lot if you choose the problem right. So these are the kinds of AIs then that are doing, you know, photo manipulation, recommending videos, scanning transactions for fraud, looking at medical images, and so forth. Like, you can do a lot actually with a worm brain. Um, and then there's the other kind of AI that we have today, or the sort of AI, which is the kind that is actually secretly a human. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the person in a robot suit level of AI. And so you actually get a lot of these. You get these services that are billed as autonomous or AI empowered in some way. And then when you look at what they're actually doing, there is some unadvertised human being that is doing the heavy lifting. So one example would be these uh, meal delivery service bots out in Berkeley that uh, not a lot of people realize are actually basically being driven by humans as like remote control cars. It's not exactly that. There is some AI that's doing some navigation, but it's basically navigating between waypoints that human drivers set down every few seconds. And uh, so in a way, it's a good way to make use of a human driver's time. So now a driver can control a few of these robots at once. But you know, on the other hand, you run into potential problems when you have systems like this, where it's just secretly a human. Because I've read interviews by users of this service who say, oh, this is so great. Like, there's now there's no human employee who I'm making wait. I can just take as long as I feel like to come out to the door. and." You know, this is, they're not realizing that there's a human on the other end. And so we see that with chatbots as well, too, where you get some some of these services that will start out with a human and then invisibly switch, or they'll start out with a AI or some kind of a chatbot. And then if things get confused, the human is, the customer is getting frustrated, then they will invisibly switch to a human employee and then that's bad for everybody because now you have a human employee who's dealing with a frustrated customer who doesn't even believe that they're a human being. So <laughs> this is one of the things that, you know, I hope that the AI in a, in a the person in a robot suit type of AI goes away or at the very least is clearly labeled so we know what we're dealing with because it can be a lot of fun to deal with an AI that's like we know is an AI and that we can mess with, because I do a lot of messing with actual algorithms. Uh, so anyway, this is why I wanted to write this book, is that we've got these stories about the uh, science fiction level, human level AIs, but we don't have a lot of stories about the uh, algorithms, the AIs that we have today. Uh, so for example, the story about the AI that was supposed to be sorting a list of numbers, except that the researchers technically told it to eliminate sorting errors, and so it solved this particular problem by eliminating the list. <laughs> or the uh, this the uh, algorithm the the resume screening algorithm from Amazon that they reported that they never ended up actually using because they couldn't get it to stop discriminating against women so it had apparently learned from the resumes of people who had been hired in the past that it should 
avoid the resumes from women. And it was very sneaky about figuring out who those would be. So it was not given gender as an input, but it could figure out who went to certain colleges, like women's colleges, or who had the word women's somewhere on their resume as in women's soccer team. And then even when they eliminated these sorts of tells, like there's just subtleties in the wording and Thing, phrasing, things like that, where it was still able to figure out and still able to discriminate, and eventually Amazon scrapped the project. Uh, but it makes you wonder about some of the other hiring algorithms that are out there. Like, if they have, have they been checked for discrimination of various source uh, forms? Because these kinds of AIs are so sneaky about finding out about these really strong, reliable clues about things that humans do, and it copies that along with the rest of human behavior. Uh, so for t what I'm talking about AI in this book, I had to pick one definition for the things that I'm actually going to say this book is about. And so I went with a definition that most uh, computer programmers are using, which is AI is referring specifically to a kind of program called machine learning algorithms. And so then in this book, I go through a whole bunch of different types and how they work. Uh, but at its most basic, what I wanted to convey to people is that it's, you know, this is kind of what we're dealing with. The difference between machine learning and regular programming is that in regular programming, of course, if you're trying to solve a problem using uh, you know, so if you're trying to solve a problem using regular programming and the problem is something like take a collection of robot parts, assemble them into some kind of robot shape and use the, that shape to walk from point A to point B, regular programming, you've got a human programmer who has to figure out step by step how to actually do all of these things, how to assemble the robot, how to use the legs to walk. And then in machine learning, it is different then. You give it the goal and then it has to figure out its own strategy via trial and error of how to get to point B. And what I love about this example is that time and time again, the way that uh, machine learning algorithms tend to solve this particular problem is by doing this. <laughs> so takes the robot parts, assembles them into a tall tower, falls over, lands at point B, technically solving the problem as it was laid out. <laughs> And so this kind of drives home, like, it can be really clever at solving problems, but it may not solve the correct problem or the one that we thought we were specifying. And what I really like about this example, too, is that you know, when I was putting together this book, I had to try and pick things that I knew were going to remain true. Because, of course, it takes you know, two years from starting the first draft to when the thing actually gets published. Most of one year, I can't really change anything. And if something's going to go out of date that fast, I don't want it in the book anyways, because I'd like the book to still be relevant like 10 years from now. But then that becomes a challenge then. How do I pick things to talk about that are going to remain true? And the robot tower is one of these things. Uh, so the earliest example I found, and I'm sure there are probably earlier ones, was in the 1990s. And then the most recent example I found is from 2018, uh, which I'm going to show you. So this particular robot, this is a work by David Ha. And uh, he set up this AI to come up with these designs for the robot legs, and then uh, also its strategy for using them to get across this obstacle course. But these are, these are the legs and the strategy that this robot designs when you restrict how big the legs are allowed to be, uh, because otherwise... <laughs> <laughs> And technically, they got to the end of the maze. So <laughs> you know, the trick with working with AI machine learning then is to set up the problem so that it actually does what you want. And you can see that even getting something simple like getting AI to walk is really, really hard. So you may see this and say, OK, we're going to restrict. You have to use a robot-shaped robot and use the legs to walk. And it turns out that doesn't always work either. So. <laughs> This particular, 
this particular AI's goal was to move fast, and <laughs> it didn't have to avoid any obstacles. It didn't tell it it had to not use its hands. There was obviously no penalty for doing gates that were really, really tired. Like, uh, tiring, like anything that would get you moving fast was fair game. And so, as far as they specified it, this AI did a really good job of moving. Uh, so, and you know, given complete freedom then on how to design robots that move, especially given the sort of imperfect physics of these simulations, you can end up with uh, creatures that look like this. I mean, this is basically what the Terminator robot should have looked like, I think. <laughs> like, I would watch this movie. <laughs> But, you know, it's not just coming up with weird gates, but it's also like hacking the physics of the simulation as well are things that AIs will do if you give them the chance. So they'll learn to do things like harvest energy from the simulation's math errors, or they'll figure out how to use collision math to like propel themselves across the landscape. Or like there was one that figured out how to bang its couple of its limbs together and send itself rocketing into the air magically. <laughs> And, you know, this is why OpenAI with the Rubik's Cube robot hand had to train their robot in so many different simulations because any one of them, it would end up figuring out some kind of clever hack to break the simulation instead of solving the problem, really. And, and remember, this is AI doing what it's asked to do. Like, this task was to accomplish something in the universe, in the matrix that we set out for it. And, you know, this is it doing a really clever job. Uh, but so this idea of understanding what it is that we really meant to ask it for it is a really broad task that it is beyond the level of today's AI. And I, my book is full of examples that kind of show this and show AIs completely misinterpreting their tasks in interesting and revealing ways. Uh, like this example from researchers at the University of Tübingen in Germany. So they were training an image recognition AI and one of the things that it was supposed to identify was this kind of a fish called a tench. Uh, but when they actually then went back and looked at what parts of the image the image recognition algorithm was finding were the most important, uh, this is what it ended up highlighting. So these are human fingers. And you might ask, why would it be looking for human fingers to identify a fish? The tench is a trophy fish. And so most of the pictures it had been trained on looked something like this. And as far as this AI knows, like fingers are part of a fish. And so there can all be sorts of, be all sorts of things like this lurking in a training data set. So there's a famous example of a group at Stanford that was trying to train one of these algorithms to recognize pictures of skin cancer. But they didn't realize at first that a lot of the tumors in their training set had been photographed with rulers for scale. Yeah, so the AI learned to detect the rulers instead. <laughs> so image recognition algorithms do all kinds of really strange things, which leads us to giraffe sighting number two. Uh, so uh, this is a herd of giraffe walking along a dirt road, according to, uh, this is powered by Microsoft Azure's uh, image recognition. Uh, so they tend to, these algorithms tend to see giraffes a lot, even when there are definitely not any around. So this is labeled a giraffe standing next to a forest. And so you may look at these and say, okay, is it being fooled kind of by this branch that looks kind of like a giraffe's neck, or there's some kind of textures in there that's fooling it. But then you see pictures like this, the close-up of two giraffes <laughs> near a tree otherwise known as the coat of arms of the House of Savoy, which, yeah, so clearly there are some weird things going on here with giraffes. Uh, seems like AI might also have a thing about sheep. So this again is Azure's Vision API, and this is a picture I took in Scotland on vacation, and it has been captioned, a herd of sheep grazing on a lush green hillside with curing in the background, tags mountain grass grazing herd sheep. And this is like exactly spookily, eerily right. If any of you have ever been to the Isle of Skye, this is the exact uh, mountains that are being that are 
that are there in the background. This is a really good job. But then, you know, in this image on the right then, I it went, used Photoshop to erase every single sheep, and they're still there in the caption, like the, nothing has changed. So, you know, are these homo, homeopathic sheep or something? Like, the answer seems to be simpler than that. Here's another picture where there were never any sheep. I know I was there, I took the picture, and they're still there, herd of sheep grazing on a lush green hillside, tags grazing sheep mountain cattle horse. So we, ha we seem to have a problem here where we have trained an image recognition algorithm without giving it a clear idea of what the word sheep actually means. Uh, and they don't have a clear idea of the problem that they're trying to solve then. Uh, so here, you know, grass field sheep standing rainbow. We also may have some uh, misunderstandings on what we mean by rainbow, that it's not just that it's wet. No, you should look at the thing in the sky. So anyway, this is why training the image recognition on self-driving cars is so hard, and why so many self-driving car failures are because the image recognition AI got confused. So for example, uh, this fatal accident in 2016, where somebody was using uh, Tesla's autopilot feature on city streets instead of on the highway, and looks like because the what happened is a truck drove out in front of the car, and the car failed to brake. And the, you know, the, the, uh, the car had definitely been designed to recognize trucks as obstacles, but what, lo what looks like happened is because it was designed for highway driving, it had not been designed to recognized trucks from the side. And so when it saw this truck driving out in front, it thought it was most likely to be an overhead sign and it would be therefore safe to drive underneath. So data is really important. It can be important in really subtle ways. Uh, so this is a, one of my favorite illustrations of that. This is a conversation I had with a bot called the Visual Chat Bot, uh, which is I confidently identified this close-up of a large water hole. And what I like about this is this is a bot that's trained on back and forth conversations that uh, people, people had uh, that were hired through Amazon Mechanical Turk. So they took turns asking, answering questions, and then gave this to train the algorithm on how do you answer questions about an image. And one of the things that it learned is that the humans were never really confused about what was going on. There was ne never really any response that was just like, I have never seen this thing before in my life. And so it learns that whatever happens, expressing utter confusion is not a thing you do. So instead, it seems to have learned to bluff and to dig itself a hole. <laughs> and so, for example, this close-up of a red apple on the table, once it has identified this as a red apple, then for the purposes of this conversation, the planet Neptune is a medium-sized red apple, and all the rest of reality will follow from that. Uh, here's another quirk of the training data. How many giraffes do you see? one. Why a giraffe? Well, we, that is bringing us to giraffe sighting number three. It turns out there is almost always at least one <laughs> giraffe. So in this black motorcycle sitting in front of a building, for example. So remember, since this AI was trained on questions that people asked and answered about images, people didn't seem to ask the question, how many giraffes are there, when the answer was zero. And so it has learned the answer is almost never zero. And it's also susceptible to this sort of first effect I mentioned, where it's overseeing giraffes and things. So here is a picture of plain rocks. There are no elephants in this picture. But this uh, AI has reported that there are a group of them. In fact, there are 10 elephants. And if you think about it, Given the training data that this AI saw, it most likely saw elephants way more often than it saw just plain rocks. So it has learned that elephants are more likely. Uh, and this is kind of called, I, you know, it's like a, it's always on the best safari ever. And there are three giraffes. <laughs> the effect also works on flying saucers. We've got 10 <laughs> flying saucers in this image. So this is sort of an illustration of all the weird, subtle ways that AI can pick up the wrong idea from the training data we gave it. So we told it that giraffes are everywhere, uh, including in my book. So there are five giraffes, which is interesting because I wrote this book and I know I only put in four. 
<laughs> Although there is an example on page 198 where there is an adversarial attack that a cockroach carries on and manages to convince security that it's a giraffe. Uh, you'll have to read the whole backstory to promise it'll make sense. <laughs> so that is my book. So I'm hoping that what it will do is give us some stories about the kinds of AI that we have today so that people can be prepared when they're making decisions about what AI to use or which AI to allow. And I hope that people will be able to get an idea of when to be impressed and when to be very skeptical because I, you know, this is going to be an essential skill people are going to need uh, going forward. So thank you. You showed us a lot of examples where machine learning did a bad job. You said you trained a model that gave you bad pickup lines. <laughs> I'm wondering how much time and effort it would take to train a model to generate good pickup lines, combine it with the chatbot and an image classifier, and then use that to run my Tinder account. And this goes without saying, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I think one of the you would have to have a threshold for like how many mistakes you were allowed to, it was allowed to make like uh cuz there are so many very creative and unexpected ways for these sorts of text generating bots to be very offensive and unoffend unintentionally offensive that you know to use it at all you there would have to be some baseline level of very very unfortunate like delete your account um, <laughs> sort of responses so I think that's why we don't see a lot of uh, machine learning powered uh, chatbots out there so yeah it's a really tough problem I mean when I'm display when I am uh, putting things up on my blog or choosing them for my book I'm usually choosing the best most interesting lines and that can be one out of every a hundred uh, sometimes or sometimes I have to look through even more of those before I find enough that are worth showing so yeah it's it's tough it is tough yeah <laughs> <laughs> We did have one question submitted um, by a person who wasn't able to attend the talk. So instead of asking what one thing do you want people who are making AIs to know, uh, the question instead was what one thing do you want the AIs who are listening in on this presentation to know? <laughs> uh, I would like to be sent all of the free chocolate and all of the free, uh, hmm, yeah, I'd like to, yeah. I, I think they're I think they're likely advertising bots. I so <laughs> trying to think. Yeah, you don't usually don't get free stuff from them. You just get ads. Oh well. Um, you've been doing this for a little while. Is it getting worse? The, is it what? Do you, is there a change what, a in the worse. weirdness? Have you been noticing things Hell get yeah. more weird or less weird? Are new algorithms more easy to exploit into weirdness, or are they? harder. Oh, yeah. So just in the last year, basically since GPT-2 came out, that is a big change in the kind of weirdness that now I am playing with for my blog. Because before, I used to be really restricted to these text generating algorithms that could generate maybe words or at most a couple of words together because their memory is so terrible. And a lot of the humor would come from these, it accidentally spells like a funny word, like it spells the word fart or something and it doesn't know that it's not supposed to. Like the paint color names was from that kind of an error. If I do that uh, kind of thing now with something like GPT-2, because it has all of this context built in, it doesn't tend to spontaneously generate, the, you know, silly words anymore. Uh, most of its words kind of make sense and kind of fit with context. And so that kind of weirdness, I don't see very, as much when I'm using that algorithm. But on the other hand, now I can do things where I'm generating entire sentences at a time or like paragraphs or lists or stories. And so there's that that just wasn't fun to do before because it was completely unreadable like a year ago. So yeah, there are new different possibilities, but I'm already kind of feeling a little bit of nostalgia for, oh, good old 2018, where you could still <laughs> get uncomprehending nonsense out of these things. So I may go back to that at some point. Okay. So uh, 
from your presentation, I saw like uh, there's a lot of challenges on on the topic. But however, I want to know like uh, in your mind or your research, right? What is your definition of AI? What is your expectation? So. For the purposes of like what is going into this book, I was using the definition of being a machine learning algorithm. So everything that basically gets put under the umbrella of machine learning algorithms, whether that's some kind of gradient descent thing, whether that's genetic algorithms like Markov chains, I've got a little section of that in there. And I'm, I know I left some stuff out and I made sure to also talk about some things that aren't technically AI because I wanted to at least mention like the human in a robot suit sort of, uh, sort of con problem as well too. So that, that's what I was using for the purposes of this book. Um, yeah, you talked about the problem of unconstrained training models coming up with ridiculous solutions, um, like the the robot, you know, having like super long legs and just falling forward or whatever. But um, are there examples of maybe? Well, it seems like I, introducing constraints on the model could potentially create more problems, like that you might miss some novel solution that a human just wouldn't even have considered because it seemed ridiculous or but it was actually a useful solution so have you seen examples of where uh, maybe something really novel came out of a model like that and like how would you avoid over constraining your your simulation that you'd miss something so yeah that is a problem you know taken to the extreme then you're back to rules based programming again if you're giving constraining everything basically uh so there is some there is some balance there to be had uh one of my favorite examples of one of these algorithms coming up with something new and innovative is actually an example i have in the book where there is a group that was uh trying to see uh, if their light-seeking robot would uh, would evolve a certain textbook solution for tying together like left and right light sensors and driving toward a light source. And there's a textbook solution called the Breitenberg solution. They were going to see if their AI would uh, develop that. Instead, what it ended up doing was spiraling in giant circles toward the light source instead, uh, which was very unexpected behavior, but when they looked at what it was doing, they found it was actually better in many ways. Like it worked better for many different robot designs and it also worked better at high speeds too. So yeah, I, I love examples like that actually. Thank you. One of the most interesting parts of your blog for me is the way you manage to convince people to collaborate with you, whether it's cat shelters or knitters or, you know, whatever. Could you talk a little bit about that experience and how, how you manage to get people on board for these crazy experiments? <laughs> yeah, so the, the question is, like, how do I manage to get people on board for some of the weirder experiments like uh, cat shelters sending me their cat names or knitters sending me their knitting patterns and actually spending hours and hours of their lives knitting or crocheting these completely non-functional items. And actually, strangely enough, like they come to me most of the time. <laughs> so the guinea pig thing that I did, like this was a shelter contacted me and said, hey, have you ever thought, you know, trained one of these to generate names from guinea pigs? Because we have a whole bunch of, we've been saving all our names for the past 15 years or whatever. Or the cat shelter, same sort of thing. Uh, the knitters, somebody came to me and said, hey, have you ever thought about generating knitting, knitting patterns? They're text-based. And then the crocheters came to me later and said, hey, you know, we want to do this too. But then other times it is relatively easy, like if I come up with an idea to get other people to play along. So like Halloween costumes, for example, that was a data set that I crowdsourced because there really was not one in existence that had a good number of existing Halloween costumes. And yeah, people, people get into it. People want to see like their own lives kind of reflected back to them through this strange machine learning lens. So it is a lot of fun. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>